The Man in Line with Andy Wint. Master Mai, good afternoon. Welcome to Man in Line on Manx Radio. We don't have uh, royalty on the Isle of Man. We have a representative uh, of the monarch on the Isle of Man and the lieutenant governor. Uh, but the man on Man in Line today for many years was, uh, was um, christened, if I can put it that way, the unofficial king of Castle Town. Member of the House of Keys for 30-odd years. Latterly Chief Minister from 2006 to 2011. Uh, Tony Brown, Faster Mike, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Andy. Um, how many times have you returned unopposed in Castle Town? Twice. Twice. And did you take that as a compliment? Oh, absolutely. I mean, in the Isle of Man politics, it's uh, very easy for anyone to stand um, as an independent. Uh, you don't have to put any money up front. Um, and it's up to you how much you spend on an election campaign. So, yes, I, I took it as a, a considerable honour that I had that trust from the people of Castletown. And 30-odd uh, years, uh, and in 30 years... Um in fact, I'll ask you later on, but if just prepare. This is going to be one of the final questions. Your your proudest moment and your, your biggest achievement in 30 years. I want, first of all, to go to the state of Castletown. And the fact is, um, my two cousins were over last week, and I did the tourist guide bit of taking people around uh, the Isle of Man. And they absolutely loved Castletown. Mm. They loved the ambience of the square, uh, the... Um, swings on the front looking out to sea and what have you uh, and uh, I just found out that didn't just happen that didn't in fact that didn't even happen recently what are the roots of the way Castletown's looking this summer well I mean the uh, uh, basis just to come back to Castletown is that of course Castletown developed as the capital of the Isle of Man and therefore its uh, format and layout is quite unique um, based on the castle centred on the castle and the only place in the Isle of Man that can do it quite like that um, um, and it's always had a, a, a market place that then became the market square and the parade which of course is in front of what used to be the garrison church which is where uh, the soldiers used to literally parade uh, when they were stationed in uh, Castle Russian Castle um, and uh, in about 2012-2013 um, the square was uh, rejuvenated by um, having it all relayed out um, restricting traffic uh, in the square in fact it goes back further than that because when I was Minister of Transport um, I stopped the traffic going around the smelt using it as a roundabout um, and the basis for that was one that I didn't think it was necessary uh, secondly we were doing some works in Castle Street and were able to slightly widen widen the uh, roadway uh, at the top end of Castle Street where it approaches the uh, parade to enable uh, cars to pass without uh, having difficulty. Um, it's tight but it's, it is passable and that meant we didn't have to have vehicles going around the Smelt Monument and it meant that when we wanted to close the square off for uh, events or anything uh, we could do that quite easily and also of course uh, an ultimate aim was to get to the stage where during the summer months uh, my view was that we could close the square off to enable it to be used for the benefit of the community and visitors alike by having attractions and events and entertainment on in the square during the day and evening without the need to close off the square uh, it looks fantastic i mean it looks extremely amenable it looks very uh, inclusive as well and uh, they've done a great job where does the money come from is this the commissioners or is it central government well, I think the Commission has done a great job in terms of uh, laying out the square. Um, I think there's a need to do more to provide entertainment and uh, attractions, if you like, um, at certain times. I mean, whether it could be done every day, I think, is questionable, but certainly at weekends and, and an odd uh, time during the week. Um, and sometimes some of the uh, larger things have been part-funded by government. So uh, between government and 
the commissioners uh, the square is being used in a way uh, that's different than its old history it's being used for the benefit of the community and I do know that many parents enjoy being there because it's near the shops um, they're happy that the children can uh, enjoy themselves in a safe area really um, but I do think that when you get to the winter months then the square should revert back to being uh, providing parking for the uh, shops and retail outlets in Castletown uh, If you want to get in touch uh, if you want to get a message Message to uh, Tony Brown or talk to Tony Brown. Uh, call sixty six thirteen sixty eight. Lines are open. Text one double six one double seven. Email studio at manxradio dot com and WhatsApp one double six one double seven. So uh, I know you watch politics uh, very keenly, Tony Brown. Mm. Um, the state of the Isle of the Man at the moment is we have politicians talking about the state of our reserves being critical, and everybody talking about watching pennies. Now, for many years, the money taps were fully open on the Isle of Man. There was lots and lots of money. How do you view the situation now? Well, I think just just to go back a little bit, because you mentioned previously, I mean... um Within the government's general reserve, it had something like uh, nearly £700 million. Um, that was when I was there and left, and uh, that had been built up over about 25 years of uh, investment and uh, creating an environment that meant we could put money in reserve. Um, and quite a substantial amount of that money has been uh, reduced, and I understand that there is concern about um, the amount of reserves, but the actual income is still outstripping the expenditure. Um, mainly, I think, because we have the Common Purse Agreement, which supplements us. Although I have to say now the Common Purse Agreement, as we call it, isn't as effective as it used to be. I think the UK treats us unfairly uh, on that and always did do when I was in negotiations. I made the point that, you know, with the internet and people purchasing online, then, in fact, the Alamand should get a share of the VAT that's collected from those purchases. Um, and the UK never accepted that. Um, and so we had to deal with it. They were the bigger partner. Um, and at one stage, whether we go further in terms of uh, our future with that relationship, I think, is a matter of time and how things develop. Um, but I think that um, a concern seems to be uh, that whilst the island seems to be happy to invest uh, substantially off Ireland, uh, the Liverpool dock area, and, for example, um, rightly have invested in a new ship, there's lots of investments that are going on, um, there seems to be a reluctance to invest within the island for the island's uh, infrastructure relating to tourism and to heritage, which are interlinked in terms of the visitors coming to the island. We look out the window here, there's a cruise ship in again. Um, maybe 2,000 people come off that cruise ship um, to come into uh, the island. Uh, we had a bigger one uh, last week and the island was you know, had 3,000 people touring around. Um, and unless our um, our heritage sites and our places are clean and tidy and up to standard, um, they will go back with a poor impression. Um, at the moment, I think that we get away with it, but there are a number of areas where there is a need for investment to uh, improve the quality of the product we have. I'm sure uh, Max National Heritage um, will, will say, in fact, I've heard them say, that they get the foot of treasury on their neck mm. and Manx National Heritage have to play the, the cards that they're dealt um, and I've heard them say yeah. their biggest expenditure is people so yeah. um, I mean Manx but, National Heritage have, a, have a, 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 a tough game at the moment. Absolutely and I think they've been treated unfairly, I mean I've made this point before, they are being underfunded for what government really expects them to do just an example, in Castletown outside of uh, Manx Grand Prix Week and TT Week if you want to go into the grammar school, the old house of keys or the nautical museum, you have to do that by appointment, that's nonsense absolute nonsense if you're a visitor and you're with your family in the car and you turn up in Castletown yes you can get in the castle and you then you're being told there's all these other facilities you don't want to make an appointment to say when you want to go and visit them you want to go and visit them while you're in the town uh, and it makes no sense I doubt if there's anywhere else in this sort of relationship um, 
within, for example, the UK and, and certainly within Ireland, where you'd have to make an appointment to go into what is a general uh, tourist attraction stroke heritage site. Um, so I, I have great sympathy for Manx National Heritage because I do think they're being underfunded in their revenue terms, which means they can't employ staff to man the sites, which makes no sense at all. And also uh, there is a, a lack of support and vision to invest in their capital schemes. And I think that's a problem too. We've got the Peggy, which is only now starting to raise its head as in terms of a, a, um, a scheme for it. But government's still only saying it's going to fund half of it. Well, the other half is unlikely to come from uh, the private sector because the amount is too high. And from an Isle of Man point of view, these investments are not only in the tourist product, i.e., providing sites for people to come and visit who come to the island but they're also important for our own heritage for us as Manx people to know what our history is it's unique and what we have and also you're safeguarding our history everywhere around us they're investing hundreds of millions of pounds every year into heritage in the Isle of Man we're investing next to nothing okay uh, right Uh, let's go to the lines David's first on now Uh, David I you're live with uh, Tony Brown Hi, Tony and uh, Andy, too. There, just two questions, simple questions for me, as far as I'm concerned. And I know a lot of people will be listening today, and a lot of them will be from Onken because I told them I was coming on. And I just want to ask Tony through you, Andy, is uh, is there a concern now that the, the government, per se, or the council of ministers, are now actively pursuing reserves to fund projects? And are we over? Can we fund some of the projects we've got, or where do we go? for the future and the second question would be and I'll leave it alone then should all members of government be take an active role within government I see them using the excuse now of not being in the department so they can't be caught to say I didn't vote on that so I was out of it Right, hi David. Yes, I've been told uh, qu- by quite a few Onken people that uh, you're coming on to talk to me today, so I was well prepared. <laughs> anyway, great to hear from you. Um, if, if, if I take the first question, this, of course, these are my views as a as a individual now, not as a politician. Yeah. Um, but in t- fact, investing your reserves within the island to me is not a, a, a sort of uh, issue that causes concern. If we invest um, some of our reserves in capital projects to create things that generate income um, and support different industries then that's a good thing if we don't do that we leave our reserves just invested in the economy of other countries to generate interest so uh, I think that you know you get that balance right you keep your reserve as much as you can but you also use it um, to invest within the product what we call the Isle of Man and you know um, we do know that the Isle of Man is in a situation where um, the vast majority of the industries are not now tourism, but we shouldn't therefore ignore the benefit of our tourism and our heritage products. They're critically important to enhancing what we have to attract people to come to the Isle of Man. And I think uh, if we invest in that properly so that the standards and the quality of what we have is good, then that will benefit us in the longer term. Um, as far as the issue of uh, members of uh, Tinwald being in government, I mean, that clearly is a personal choice. I do think think and I've always been of this view you know this when you were a member I do think that members should uh, be willing and and want to play a part in government uh, to actually influence how policies are developed and how things happen Um, I think the new pay structure has damaged that I think there is no logic at all in a member working in a department uh, getting a certain amount of uh, pay and a member who doesn't work in a department getting exactly the same pay. You now have a situation where members, some members, are judging that in fact there's no logic in being in government because if you're not in government you have less work, you can deal with your constituents in a different way and there is no benefit really from this is some of their perspectives I suspect in being within the government my view is that if you're not in government you can't really influence how it actually does things Okay, Uh, final word David 
Oh, he's gone. Sorry. Uh, okay. <laughs> Alison, uh, a message in now. What does Mr. Brown think of the way ministers appear to have no power to change things in their department? Is that a, a fair view? Was it ever <laughs> thus? No. I mean, the ministers have all the power. Um, the minister is the department, um, and what the minister says goes. What a minister cannot do is break the law. What he cannot do is... Um, expend money that he has no right to expend but all the powers that the minister requires are set out in legislation and if a minister says I want that to happen and it's legal it has to happen if it doesn't happen then I'm afraid that fault lies with the minister um a message in now from uh, Mr. Brown is absolutely right. The railways, trams, heritage uh, site should be prioritised, not uh, reduced. In Castletown, there seems to be a desire to uh, demolish buildings. Is that true? Is anything being knocked down in Castletown? Well, oh, what's happening with the fire station? Oh, well, maybe that's what the uh, person is referring to, the fire station. At the moment, the uh, the fire station is uh, being used as a store. Uh, this is the former fire station in the town centre opposite the town hall. Um, I came out recently expressing concern that the commissioners had decided to, as a first step, seek planning permission to demolish the site when there is no uh, strategy or policy as to how they're going to redevelop the site. Uh, and to me, the whether or not you demolish it is a later issue, not a, a, an initial issue. And the only reason they need planning permission to demolish, of course, is because it's within the conservation area. Um, and at the end of the day, I'm realistic enough to know that the fire station is basically a garage. But the, I think there is a benefit that should be properly examined before the commissioners get to the stage of what they think they should do on the site. OK, a message in now from, this is Texter623. Uh, my word, we miss Tony as an MHK, a complete contrast to our current members. Uh, he's quite right, m is underfunded. In response to uh, David's comment about members being in departments, it's easy to resign from a role when you still gain the, sa gain the same annual salary as an MHK every year, uh, other by, uh, than by playing to the gallery. Uh, a gesture a few months ago from a council town MHK makes no difference at all other other than the meaning he was doing less work for the same salary. And this text that says, I elect my MHKs to make a difference, not to make a gesture. Tony? Yeah, well, I used to take the view quite simply. When I was elected as an MHK, I had five years to have an impact on the Isle of Man. And hopefully I would get re-elected. But what I knew at that stage was, all being well, I had five years to influence and do things to benefit the people and benefit the island. And I think, and I hope that the majority of our uh, members of TIN will still have that same view. Um, I'm not sure um, the benefits to an individual member of being outside of government, how that benefits them and their constituents. Um, you're not compromised in the way that some say, because if you're on depart a department, you're not tied to that department to the extent that you have to do absolutely everything it says. There are guidelines in where you have flexibility and certainly um, where your constituency may well be compromised, you have the ability either to step out of the uh, matter that's being dealt with or voting against it as long as the minister advised in advance our, our system because we don't have a party political government system is flexible and it should be flexible because members are independently elected they're not elected by a party on a party ticket um, and if you don't have that flexibility you end up in a position where members will do what some are doing which is stepping out that is not to me good for the Isle of Man. Uh, and again, lots of people seem to have the idea that uh, uh, I'm putting, if you like, a UK matrix, a UK system on the Isle of Man and bringing party politics into the Isle of Man. What's your view about that? Well, to be blunt, whether or not we have party politics will be a matter for the people to decide at some, some stage in the future. My personal view is somebody who worked 30 years within the system and, you know, you're alone. Whatever people think, you're, I was a single seat constituency member, you're one person uh, working and persuading members to support things that you think are important to your constituency or important to the Isle of Man. Yes, there's a collective called the Council of Ministers. They are there to give a lead and to make sure government operates 
streets effectively uh, and the ministers individually are meant to do that through their departments and civil servants are there to serve the people of the Isle of Man um, they're there to ensure that whatever is decided politically is actually implemented um, it's not for them to judge whether or not it should be implemented once the decision's made that's the political decision um, Tinwell members are there to hold to account the chief minister and um, the ministers the house of keys are there to pass legislation which in itself holds to account the policies of the government if they decide to pass legislation um, so there's lots of safeguards in there um, and our system has developed over you know decades and especially since the ministerial system came in to provide safeguards for the public ultimately the members of Tinwald and the ministers have to be and are answerable in totality to the people of the Isle of Man and the people have to make them answerable to the points that they think are important to them. Okay, a message in from Brett, uh, sent it in this week, who says, uh, can Mr Brown can Mr Brown offer a solution to when Castle Russian High School is going to be built? Well, I, I think the answer to that is no and I think this is a real problem you know there seems to be a lack of certainty on pretty straightforward contracts I spent most of my political life uh, actually heading up politically contracts uh, for developments in the Isle of Man and I can't understand why there continues to be this delay um, and also the uncertainty about are we or are we not going to replace the swimming pool well of course we should why would you take away a regional facility like like a swimming pool attached to a school, a secondary school. When I was a child, we didn't have swimming pools in that sense, so we didn't learn to swim. My son, when he, he was at school, learned to swim. My daughter did. They were taught at school how to swim. We have water all around us. They need to know how to deal with it. Um, so I can't understand why there are so many delays on just getting on with the job of making a decision putting the money in the budget, which you do over a period of time, and getting on with the development. At the end of the day, most of these borrowings are done through government using its own resources, the money that we've generated over years. And it's a good investment. What can be a greater investment than investing in our children? So what's the logjam? And again, the, the, the layperson will look at this from the outside and we see obfuscation all around, you know. Uh, first of all, it was the land, then the land was, uh, uh, it was, was zoned and everything. So, so what is the problem? Is it lack of money? Is it lack of intent, lack of will? Where's what, what, it gone wrong? I, I think the honest answer is none of us really know. Um, I certainly don't really know. Um, it just doesn't seem to be moving in a way it should be. It's been talked about. They've had plans drawn up, as I understand it, some years ago. Somebody needs to sit down and make a proper decision. And when I say someone, I'm talking about the politicians, uh, to make a decision. The department needs to decide whether or not it's going to build a new school at Castle Russian, a new secondary school for the south of the Isle of Man. Now, the school is getting on in its years, and it needs replacing. They've started some of the work in terms of the field at the one side where they're going to put the new playing fields. Um, and I think the uncertainty does create a problem in terms of where is it going? When are we going to have a new school? And is it going to incorporate our new swimming pool? Mm. And the answer to that is, yes, it should. And please, can somebody keep the public informed as to the time scale for when the school's going to start to be developed? It seems to cut across the, the ambition the Chief Minister has and the KPMG various reports that came out and of course to up the population to 100,000 so if, if we are going to need more people we'll need better schools and the thing is Castle Russian school itself is a fine entity the building is knackered and is falling down and, um, and, the, and the staff are making the most of it uh, but it seems to cut across the government's ambition you know to, to mm. how can you grow a population when you have a crumbling school in Castle Town well I th I th as you say what's a better advert than a brand new school well absolutely and and i mean it'll take three well if you start now to get your start your planning and then start the contracts start the development you're talking at least five years before a new school from today would be completed um so you're already talking five years um i think the other thing is that um when we talk about increasing the population, if that's the aim, and it clearly seems to be the aim, there are implications to that which are clearly 
uh, and were clearly identified in the 80s when this started happening in the 70s and 80s which are that you have a knock-on effect to all your services you need more school rooms you need more doctors you need uh, well hopefully the hospital's big enough because it was uh, built to be big enough for a bigger population but you know you have an infrastructure that has to be uh, enhanced as well so it's not just a matter of saying let's do that you have to do the other side and I presume that the chief minister and his team have identified this and are working towards improving and uh, enhancing the infrastructure of the Isle of Man to make sure this can all be accommodated. Um, a message in uh, just to say it's from Julian just talking about the current situation of the swimming pool his southern pool he's a big swimmer down there permanent closure for all day Sundays and most of Wednesdays as well and I think um, well I mean what do you think of and again it's the hand we talked about the hand that MNH has been dealt by Treasury what do you think about the hand that the southern uh, the swimming board has been dealt well I I was involved partly in this because I had people approach me and to be honest um, it's quite straightforward the funding of the swimming pool is a government responsibility that's the capital cost and the operational cost the local authorities pay and I think that's slightly increased now but did pay at that time a two and a half pence rate uh, equivalent income to contribute towards the administration of the pool now that was determined in the 1970s that policy has proceeded right through what seems to come out from government is these I, I even use the term the pool's insolvent it's not a company it can't be insolvent in that sense it's a statutory absolutely yeah. statutory board and funded by Tinwald through the Department of Education and whatever it's other and title statutory, is statutory boards can't go bust no because ultimately Tinwald has to fund them um, so there seems to be a bit of confusion from what I can gather and certainly there was with the Southern Swim Pool um, that in fact they had a problem because they were being told that they uh, didn't that there wasn't the resources to fund the pool it's nonsense why is the pool shut on a Sunday when children are off school that's the very time families and children can get together so lots of parents work on a Saturday Sunday is the one day they can go to the swim pool with their children we're not seeing these restrictions brought into the NSC why is it being brought into the southern pool purely because they are being underfunded to ensure that the pool can operate in the way it's always been envisaged and always was funded so is there a way out this uh, for for the the, the southern the swimming pool board well there is and political pressure is what it's called and don't forget six of the mhks in tinwald represent the areas that are components of the southern swim pool so they can I would have thought bring reasonable pressure on those in uh, p- positions of authority to make this properly uh, get funded. Uh, uh, a message in now, uh, just regarding um, this is about building the population from will. Uh, what does Mr. Brown think of the temporary suspension of the work permit system? I have to say I'm confused. I don't know why they've done that. Um, they already, already um, made uh, changes to the work permit system to allow professionals to come in without the need for permits and to, to other areas. I'm not sure the benefit of scrapping it all together, albeit temporarily, is going to be ring to the Isle of Man. I'm not really sure what that's about, and I don't think it's actually been explained how it actually will benefit the Isle of Man. The work permit system can respond very quickly if it's uh, a case that's clearly just justified and it's meant to be a way of controlling um, who we let into the island to work in the island because potentially there could be problems I mean its origins go back to it was brought in because of the building trade um, because they were concerned at that time the House of Keys that there was uncontrolled um, to use a term which isn't right for work permits but immigration in other words we can't control immigration because that's part of our UK agreement but we have the right to control employment and that was how they used it. So I'm not really sure why it's been uh, sort of uh, rescinded to allow it to be an open door. Uh, lots to get through between now and one. We're with uh, former Chief Minister Tony Brown on Manx Radio. Get in touch by text, call, email or WhatsApp. 
Athol Garage in Valasala is more than a Nissan authorized repair center. Their team of highly factory trained and experienced technicians will service and repair any make and model with dedicated aftercare too. With Athol, you get a competitive fixed price menu and a courtesy car if needed. Pity this driver didn't know that. Oh, great! I told you to go to Athol! Athol, a garage to swear by, not swear at. Book now at athol.im or call the A-Team 820082. There's a new way to Subway with two fantastic menus. Which will you go for? The all-new Subway series with 15 irresistible creations like the Big Bombay Sub, Great Goddess Salad, Emperor Wrap and Big Cheese Steak Sub Melt. Or create your own. You pick the ingredients you want and build your own sub, salad or wrap the way you want it. There's a great mix of healthy and indulgent menu items available from Subway and ShopRite, Peel and Port Erin. We are ready to go at B&B Furniture with a wide range of manager specials throughout the store. If it says I'm ready to go, then it is ready to go. Priced in store for immediate delivery and no long wait for stock to arrive onto the island. Get the furniture you're longing for with no wait, no deposit required and 0% finance available when you get ready to go at B&B Furniture. It's all here under one roof at the B&B Furniture three-story showroom in Snugborough. b b Furniture the summer furniture sale is on now at Riley's in Cool Road, Braddon, with up to 25% off top brand ranges like Norfolk Leisure and Pacific Lifestyle, so you can relax for less. Riley's, follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Have you ever wondered what makes people want to do this? Go! Join me, Beth Espy, for the Journey to a Dream podcast, where I talk to riders about why they want to race here on the Isle of Man. You can't even explain it in words, like, a bit like Grand Theft Auto, the video game. Feeling of petrol and stuff running through your veins, it just, ah, oh, yeah, it just feels amazing. If you're outside the sport, it looks absolutely mad. I think there's other two types of people, really, people who want to do it and people who don't. Journey to a Dream, available to download at motorsport.manxradio.com or your favourite podcast provider. The Man in Line with Andy Wint. Former Chief Minister Tony Brown is uh, with us just talking about uh, Richard dropped a note in just to say this is concerning heritage railways. Uh, Rumour has it that they're planning massive cuts to the heritage. It was rumour, that's just skeet, that they're planning massive cuts to heritage railways. Uh, Yet they're an integral part of our history as well as tourist industry. Uh, Just ask Tony, says Richard, uh, why doesn't he think the government values heritage, not just from a tourist point of view, but also, uh, you know, us, the people who live on the Isle of Man. Yeah, I, I find it quite strange, to be honest, why there is not this understanding of the value uh, in the Isle of Man of our unique heritage, which is different to the normal British heritage because we, we our origins are Celtic, Viking and so on. Um, and we have lots of things here that people would bite your hand off for. Charles Gard's video, if you saw that one about the horse trams, I yeah. mean, he was absolutely right. He have a collective of steam trains electric trams horse trams and yet they're not being given the importance that they should be given you had the cruise ship in last week right and the horse trams weren't operating you wait you wait 30 minutes for a horse tram to go on a 10 minute ride now to nowhere basically you dumped off uh, by the villa marina at a junction i mean the visitors got off the cruise ship and the horse tram's a mile away, but it was shut, by the way, because it was Monday. These schedules for the cruise ships are given out about 12 to 18 months beforehand. Why did nobody know in authority that the actual cruise ships were coming in with about 3,000 people getting off those ships who want to use our unique transport system? Um... Gary on 476 uh, what's Mr Brown's opinion on the current culture within the civil service and Isle of Man government? Lots of this has been referenced uh, and sort of side references by the Chief Minister uh, that it needs to be improved. Ian even saying that the current culture is toxic Um, Was it toxic in your time? Well I didn't think so Um, but then I was in there so maybe people outside thought that that it was. Uh, I only can say that I found that the vast majority and certainly the senior civil servants were respectful of the minister's positions and and did their work as they were required to do. Uh, Like anything you know in middle management there were some ups and downs but they were usually dealt with because at the end of the day uh, the chief executive of a department has the responsibility under the minister's direction 
um, to ensure that the department uh, operates effectively. Um, as far as politicians are concerned, and I can't judge today, I'm not in there, um, but the, the principles are quite simple. I mentioned it before. The minister is of the department. The minister makes a decision. It's the responsibility of the chief executive and his or her officers to carry out the instructions, decisions of the minister. Pretty straightforward, really. OK, I mean, big names when you were there, Fred Keswick, Della Fletcher and people like that. And uh, I mean, if you wanted something done, was it generally done? It was definitely done. <laughs> I can tell you that now. And if it wasn't, there was trouble. You don't leave it. You, you find out why is it not being done. And if necessary, disciplinary action was taken. Uh, you were a minister in what health and social security, local government and environment, uh, tourism and leisure, uh, transport, and as well as uh, chief minister as well. Where did you feel you were most effective? Um, it's quite hard to say. I think... I felt anyway that local government in the environment was the one I was most effective with um, in terms that we were going through a housing crisis which we um, took great efforts to resolve. We were buying houses off the shelf to use a term from developers who were just building on spec so we could house our people quicker. Uh, we had government mortgage schemes that were providing support for many young people who couldn't get into the housing ladder and for older ones we brought in a scheme where regardless of your age you could get a mortgage and I know one family for example I mean they passed on now where the uh, elderly parents who were I say elderly that's the wrong term really but the parents who were in, just coming up to 60 uh, actually got a mortgage and because of it they moved out of a public sector house and what happened is the mortgage scheme was set up so that when they passed on uh, um, then the, the government got its money back uh, from the sale of the property and the family got whatever the balance was. So there are ways to deal with it. The other one is, you know, we dealt with um, different things like refuse. We had a comprehensive uh, refuse facility uh, and policy, uh, reuse, resource um, and dispose and so on, recycle. All done in there in that we looked at um, reconstructing local government into 13 local authorities and it only failed because council ministers wouldn't support it. It went to Tinnell because a member moved it there and it only lost it because council ministers didn't support it. Um, but it would have been, I think, a much better system than we now got for local government, which is actually, uh, I think, a bit of an issue. Um, there's lots of disquiet amongst younger people about getting onto the property ladder. And as you say, in, in um, uh, local government, in the, you were there five years, mm. so you got a handle on it. Um, what was your perception then of, of moving that along and getting young kids onto the property ladder and getting them properties? Well... My view is, is, I suppose, pretty straightforward. Whether it's old-fashioned now, I don't know. But, I mean, I'm not a big fan of shared equity. I think that has its uh, limitations. Um, because the, the Isle of Man relies on the UK high street banks to provide mortgages, um, then what we have is a situation where their schemes are set up to operate effectively within the United Kingdom and are not necessarily uh, good enough for the Isle of Man in terms of their flexibility. And the only way I think you overcome this is by government having a government mortgage scheme which is specifically aimed at helping those who wouldn't necessarily get a mortgage from the, the general high street lenders and you can then fill that gap to some degree. Um, I want to talk to you about um, getting into politics um, and your route into politics involved a motorcycle accident, is that right? That's right, yeah. You were, were you DJing then? I was DJing then, I'd been DJing for some years before that and uh, I suppose that in itself, the 7.30 disco which I was uh, a, a component of in terms of the committee and setting it up, uh, gave me some insight into uh, committee work and managing things and the motorcycle accident after that, I got into politics. So the uh, let me show you this right. The seven thirty disco. Did you lose the venue and campaign to get the venue back? Is that right? No, no. Uh, it it just in a way faded away. Right. Uh, it had run for about seven or eight years. It was a voluntary organisation. Uh, used to be held in the uh, what is now St Mary's on the Harbour in Castletown, which was then the church rooms, and we used to have three hundred young people every week in there, and uh, it was of course um, alcohol free venue. Uh, and it was very, very popular, and it used to be packed out. So you had the, the, the what were you riding, by the way, when you had the accident? What was 650 it? 650 Yamaha. Oh, crikey. Where was the accident? Uh, the Whitestone Garage. 
Um, you were in hospital for how long? Three weeks in hospital and then about another six weeks convalescing and about another year and a half before I was reasonably right again. <laughs> and mulling it over, politics came into your head? Well, no, I, I'd, I'd been uh, asked when, I, even in the days of the disco, I was being encouraged to stand for the commissioners, but I was only 20, so they were full of old men. Why would I, as a 20-year-old, want to get involved in that? That was my view at the time, which I suppose would be reflected by most people even today. Um, and the commissioners had a lot more responsibilities than they do today. Uh, they were responsible for highways, sewers, housing, ev- all sorts of things. Um, and it just evolved. After the accident, I had such a response from people in Castletown. Um, and I was convalescing when the election came up and I was encouraged to uh, to stand which I did and I topped the poll by 200 and something votes biggest turnout they'd ever had 64% turnout presumably you got your pals to be voting is that right well I did did you do any canvassing oh I did canvassing but I mean there was a short time between it because of course the House of Keys election was in November of that year so we only literally had a couple of weeks Uh, but that big I think the big thing that came out of it was it brought out a lot of young voters to vote and they were uh, coming out because I was a young person standing and they they wanted to support me and I got a lot of support from older people in town said let's give this young fella a chance OK, uh, let's get to the lines again. Juan's on now. Hi, Juan. You're live with Tony Brown. Afternoon, Andy. Hi, Tony. How are you? Hi, June. Yeah. Tony, a um, couple of things. I um, uh, totally support what you're saying about um, the Manx National Heritage, and I think um, this administration, probably the administration before, will probably be remembered for helping take the Manxness away from the Isle of Man a little bit um, with what's happening. Um and um, a sense of a belonging, I think, which is happening all over the place at the moment with people not feeling a, a sense of community belonging, which um, is part of the global agenda. But I, I pick up on your, um, your your points before the minister is in charge of the department, and I, I've, I've approached a couple of ministers on this programme about that. Um, but I, I, I do align with the fact that if a minister um, is not competent in that department and has not done his relative studies in that department, then he takes takes the advice from the chief executive or the civil servants that are in that department. So um, they're left held holding the baby and the chief executives have got no responsibility and walk away from it. So I would suggest there that maybe some of the ministers are, um, are not aligned fully with a lot of the facts and take their information from the chief executives. OK, let's take that one first. Yeah, I, I, I would answer that by saying that basically it's about commitment. I mean, a minister and I did, will always take advice from officers. They will give options, they will give advice because they're doing the detailed work, they will provide papers. The minister has to assess what's being uh, recommended to him and the minister has to con- consider whether or not they think that's appropriate for the way the Isle of Man should go forward or appropriate uh, way to deal with the issue that's before them. Um so there's nothing different now to then in terms of the officers giving advice. That's that's how the system works and always has worked. Ultimately, the public expect, and I expect, that the person who is elected makes the decision. And the whole system was set up, the ministerial system, to focus responsibility on a minister so that they were answerable directly for the actions of their department. No one else, just the minister. Now, they might have members on the department, but they would work under the um, delegation of the minister and only have certain powers. But ultimately, the minister is the one that's held to account by the chief minister and is held to account by Tinwald and that's absolutely right the system is pretty straightforward in that way where you have a problem is if a minister isn't competent or if a minister is not able to grasp the issues then I think that's a matter for the chief minister to judge and if necessary take action that they feel necessary Um, but there is a learning curve ministers will take time to learn Critically, it's important that they understand their legislation. Critically, it's important that they question the officers. They challenge the officers. They should be acting as if they were Joe Bloggs, the public, trying to find out why an officer is recommending a certain course of action and whether or not it's actually reasonable to take that decision. And sometimes they will have to make decisions that are unpopular. I did. You have to, or the island couldn't go forward. Okay, June. 
Yeah, in, in, um, in uh, government PR terms, there's quite a bit to unpack in that one. But I think that basically it, it boils down to what I said there, Tony, um, in, in respect of whether the ministers are competent um, and actually um, uh, study what they're being told by the chief execs. I mean, um, the, the, the overspends that we've had recently, I mean, there's always been overspends, been overspends on the prison and the courtrooms, but the overspends recently have been terrible. Um, you know, even talking to politicians in the UK, they can't understand the amount of of, um, of overspend. Um, and again, like like I said just before, um, the minister is is held accountable and and is holding um, the baby, where the chief executive walks off with a big pension, um, and all our money's being spent. And that brings me on to my my, my second question, really, with um, the equality and social governance that um, is going on around the world at the moment. Um, at what stage? does the Isle of Man government stop having teeth and the UK crack a whip over here with certain regulations of things? Well, which particular regulations, June? Um, basically, well, you know, um, obviously you've got your, your, your VAT agreements and stuff like that, but basically on, on um, the immigration into the island, the type of people we'd be taking in, um, and all the other stuff that's going on with, um, let's say, the woke agenda, which seems to be the, the buzzword at the moment, but there seems to be um, uh, 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 an approach by government of um, taking these agendas in over here, which... Uh, as you said before, quite rightly, we're we're quite unique on the Isle of Man, and a lot of this stuff is not going to work here, and it's not going to it's not going to go down well here. So, at what stage does the Isle of Man government turn around and say, no, we don't want that here? Right. Um, uh, first thing I think to clarify is the Isle of Man is actually independent, as you know, of the United Kingdom. We're not part of the United Kingdom, never have been. So our type of uh, system is different to that in Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland. We are not a devolved a parliament in that way. We actually were there before Westminster established a parliament. Um, and because of that, that's always been acknowledged and uh, taken into account in how we operate. Um, as far as immigration, is concerned, the Isle of Man, because we're not a sovereign state, um, actually has the the British government providing immigration controls, and our officers work under the uh, regulations issued by the United Kingdom. We have no choice in that while we have the agreement we have. So whatever the UK decide as the rules for immigration apply in the Isle of Man exactly the same. VAT is exactly the same. These apply because we allow them to apply in the Isle of Man because over the years uh, and up to date the Isle of Man has not felt that it wants to go down the road of being a sovereign state i.e. fully independent. So therefore it influences certain things. Um, it doesn't mean Immigration, you can't change much, but certainly in VAT, the Isle of Man has over years been successful in uh, negotiating some variances within the VAT agreement. For example, tourism was 5% in the Isle of Man, whereas it was uh, 20% in the United Kingdom. Why? Because you can't export the tourist accommodation product, but you can export, for example, if you manufacture goods. So uh, there were ways of overcoming that, and Donald Gelling successfully did that. OK, all right. June, sorry, we've got to dash on because there's lots to do, but thanks for calling today, June. Cheers, Andy. OK. Um, Thank you. I, I remember talking to Tony about the election. Apparently that the square was mobbed with people when you were elected. Is that right? You filled uh, the Castletown Square. Yeah, it was. It was. I mean, we were all surprised. In those days, the uh, town hall used to be where uh, Coffee Craft is now, which is the big building in, in the square opposite Barclays Bank. And I can remember we were upstairs um, in uh, the boardroom doing the count and uh, there was a lot of uh, sound clearly of people outside in the square usually the uh, election results were out by about nine o'clock there was maybe 30 or 40 people there and the inspector of police Derrickson looked out the window and went oh my goodness and the, the square was absolutely chock a block with people and he had to get on the radio to get police officers down because there was no police they hadn't expected it and the count didn't finish till just after 12 o'clock um, and when we came out there was over a thousand people there it was absolutely phenomenal
OK, very quickly, could you ask Tony Brown to explain clearly <laughs> the difference between loan through shared equity and government mortgage? It sounds like government uh, should take the risk that, that the banks wouldn't. Yeah, th- well, the shared equity, of course, means that there is somebody else who has a, a component of your property and, and uh, that you don't totally own your property. If you get a government mortgage, and I'm one who, uh, without the government mortgage in, in the 19, late 1970s, my wife and I wouldn't have bought our house, we couldn't have done it. Um, it means that the government can waive, or not waive, that's the wrong word, but can create a mortgage system that meets a our needs and for example we could buy an old house in Castletown which lots of people did uh, that were on the market and do them up Um, and we got a a mortgage from government which was 100% with a small grant it meant we could afford a mortgage Um, and we don't have that today Uh, one is some of these banks are reluctant to give a mortgage out to an old property and the other is you need at least 25% in most cases before they'll give a, a mortgage for the other 75% government can avoid that and help people do you think there's a the government should be getting involved yes i think because we're an island and because the pressures on the island are different in other words we have a small amount of land that's available for housing development and um, we have a population that requires housing and housing is important uh, for everybody and it's far better to give people the opportunity to buy the houses than to have them renting in the private sector paying high rents or renting in the public sector and uh, not moving out so give opportunities where you can the carrot is always better than the stick so I uh, asked at the start of the program to tell us then what sh- what was your most uh, proud achievement where do you think you made the most difference 30 years in keys in the ministerial portfolio commissioners well Without a doubt, I mean, uh, being minister in departments was the greatest uh, influence I had in general terms, directly affecting things. Um, there's no doubt as chief minister I was able to uh, influence the overall policy of government to right across government and make the teams work together. And in fact, I'm the only uh, chief minister that retained all his ministers for his full five-year term. Uh, and that's not because they were creeping to me, it's because they were doing their job effectively and we had clear direction on where we wanted to go and I hope we made a difference that helped many many people Um, certainly our uh, involvement was to care about the island I think there's a lack of care and pride at the moment from certain areas I mean you come off the plane you look at the state of the airport garden now it's terrible it looks like a cabbage patch to be honest the uh, you go out to the plane you walk through those uh, covers and they're dirty they need washing down they should be washed every morning first thing before the first flight they're just it's the impression it gives Um, so I think my my greatest is just being able to represent the people of the Isle of Man and doing the best I could. OK, thanks for being with us today. Former My pleasure. Chief Minister Tony Brown, and we're back with another open line tomorrow, thanks to Howie on the phones today. W-I-N-T